Okay. Right. Um, just David, one of Oh, baby. David, can you hear me? David, so. Yeah, I can hear you. David, can you hear me? Yes. I test again, David, because you were very slight with your voice. Can you hear me now? Is that any better? Yeah, and you might talk even a little bit louder. Okay. I think, I'm I think you might hear it. Hear it. Do All right, we're ready to start, so go ahead, go ahead David. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody to the final lecture in the Springs Lecture Series. Uh, as we get close to the end of a very productive semester in a very intriguing lecture series. Thanks to Craig Connick for pulling it all together with help from students and of course our terrific faculty. And I look forward to Daniel's talk tonight. Craig, over to you. Let me uh, introduce you on the, the big screen. So I, I asked uh, Dan for an introduction and instead he sent me an explanation. <laughs> so I read an explanation. If you were asked to write a book, what would it be about? Would your narrative maintain or challenge the status quo? Do you know whose story you are living in? This lecture is an introduction to narrative architecture. It explores how the built world is shaped by stories, oral histories, and creationist myths. With examples ranging from the United States, the Ukraine, and Palestine, this lecture brings to light the narratives that uphold much of the built environment and colonial power structures that undergird them. In this lecture, Dan will present his own work at the intersection of architecture, journalism, and labor history. This will include unbuilt museum proposals, built museum installations, a regional planning project for Greater New York, and some recent investigatory writing projects. I want to welcome Dan to the podium. Oh, good. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, so close to finals. Um, so a little bit of background about myself uh, that I think will be helpful is that I studied architecture and now um, really working mostly as a writer, well as a teacher and a curator. So I kind of arrived into journalism and what I call narrative architecture through design. So um, yeah, let's, let's hit it. So, um, Narrative and storytelling and architecture are things that I take very seriously. Very often, instead of looking at a project's drawings, I will evaluate a project mostly from its project description, the case studies the architect use in their presentation, et cetera. I know that architects primarily make drawings, but as an architect, my problem is that that's not really how my brain works. In short, I think that it's very easy for images to lie to us and that the words on paper are the real windows into what the architect is thinking, their agenda. So tonight I'm going to talk about narrative architecture, where storytelling and the built world collide. In the first half of the lecture, I'm going to talk about how exactly the built world is shaped by stories, oral histories, and creationist myths. In the second half, I'm going to give some examples from my own work, and my own writing. Um, so last week, uh, for those of y'all that were able to make it, Dr. Craig Wilkins from the University of Michigan gave a really great talk about why he feels so passionately about writing. And for me, it was a bit about the crisis that architecture criticism is in today. So Dr. Wilkins brought up the fact that not as many newspapers, if any, hire as many critics as they used to. Um, there's, a, there's a deficit of voices talking about the built world. And um, today, I think these voices are so important. And so um, last week, Dr. Wilkins uh, gave a beautiful presentation about why exactly he writes. And I'm gonna read off some quotes of his that I particularly liked. I write because I'm a fan of stories, from the grand to the bland and everything in between. 
desire to build is the desire to say something. Writing is not apart from architecture, it is a part of architecture. Writing to clarify and to make folks think, not to obfuscate. This is how I approach writing as well. Um, and this is a quote that I think explains why architects should know about storytelling. It's by um, a man named uh, Sharon Rothbard, who is a human rights activist and architect in occupied Palestine. That's the author of a brilliant book that I'm going to talk a lot about tonight. Uh, Sharon once said, a paradoxical rule. A city is always a realization of the stories that it tells about itself. A city is always a realization of the stories that it tells about itself. So this is a great quote. What, at what point is the, the design part of the architecture or the storytelling? I, I think that's a really beautiful thing. So much of Sharon Rothbard's work as a writer and architect deals with issues that are not easy to talk about. Specifically, the human rights abuses perpetrated by the IDF and how colonization shapes city form. Despite the very real physical human rights abuses that Rothbard deals with on a daily basis, he still feels that narrative and storytelling are absolutely essential mechanisms for overthrowing oppressors. Another quote. This time it's from a, not an architect, but a science fiction author from Portland, Ursula Ligon. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art, and very often in our art, art of words. In our science fiction, following in the footsteps of Karl Marx, Legin shows us that indeed other worlds are possible, and the roadmap for how to get there so often begins with words on paper. And the last quote that I'll share before I get into um, some less uh, textual stuff is by Doug Spencer, a historian theory professor of architecture at Iowa State University. Um, just last week, Doug Spencer said, the architectural imagination is a classist trope and always has been. The world will only be made livable again through solidarity and collective resistance to the deathly logic of capital. In his writings, Spencer explores the class alignment that the architect has historically had with capital. From today with star architects like Derek Engels working hand in hand with New York's most powerful real estate companies in the NYPD, to the times of Leon Battista Alberti, working hand in hand with the royal families of Italy and actively breaking labor strikes on his construction sites. The architect's alignment with capital, says Spencer, is a fundamental issue that needs fixing if architects are to play any active role whatsoever in repairing the world. So before the lecture starts, I kind of want to push the attention back to students and everybody in this room. And uh, what this was one of the best questions that I was ever asked as a student. Um, fruit for thought. If you were asked to write a book, what would it be about? Would it maintain or challenge the status quo? Do you know whose story you are living in? What is narrative architecture? Narrative architecture is an instrument for world building. It's where the built environment and storytelling collide. Narrative architecture can be a tool either for liberation or oppression, which depends on who is doing the narrating. Um, so narrative architecture is also a buzzword that we hear a lot today. Um, a lot of architects that are interested in things like the Green New Deal use the phrase narrative architecture to describe how to communicate a very large social and political campaign to a wide audience of constituents. Narrative architecture is a helpful tool for collapsing infrastructure, social and political movements that may span an entire continent all into one project to make it digestible. Now a project to the left of the Green New Deal um, is another instance, I think, of beautiful narrative architecture called um, the Red Deal. The Red Deal is a plan for indigenous action to save the earth that includes land redistribution to North America's indigenous peoples as part of its agenda to fight the climate crisis. 
Nick Estes from the University of New Mexico is an architect of the Red Deal. In his book, Our History is the Future, Estes talks about the role that narrative and storytelling plays in his work. In his book, he writes, while traditional historians merely interpret the past, radical indigenous historians and indigenous knowledge keepers aim to change the colonial present and to imagine a decolonial future by reconnecting to indigenous places and histories. For this to occur, those suppressed practices must make a crack in history. Hidden from view, from view to outsiders, this constant tunneling, plotting, planning, harvesting, remembering, inspiring for freedom is the most important aspect of revolutionary work. It is from everyday life that the collective confidence to change reality grows, giving rise to extraordinary events. This quote in Estes' own work as a historian and activist demonstrates how history is not neutral. There's always the victor who gets to tell it, but history can also be a tool for the oppressed to write their own future. This is another quote that's in line with um, Nick Estes' thinking. Uh, it's by some friends of mine, Cruz Garcia, Natalie Frankowski from Why Think Tank. They also teach at Iowa State. And um, they also write about how history is not neutral. History is something that is agreed upon and it only seems like it's true. So in an article for the Funambulist, um, Why writes, history doesn't exist. Historical narratives do really exist, like propaganda are rendered with ideology. They are real productions that satisfy the positions of settler colonization, ruling classes, capitalism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarch. Cruz and Natalie, my think tank, are some examples of people who today are, I think, um, revisiting paper architecture, which I'm sure a lot of you all have seen the, the image on the left, Super Studios kind of iconic, um, image of Manhattan. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So what is paper architecture? Um, Adolfo Natalini from Super Studio said that um, ethical practice in capitalism is impossible. So then my architecture will stay on paper. So uh, in the 60s and 70s, groups like Super Studio made these incredible allegorical collages of um, cities, and they weren't necessarily proposing things that should be built, but uh, they were criticisms, and they were using paper and collage to make those criticisms. And why is similar? So uh, at a lecture that Cruz and Natalie gave last year, they said something that has always stuck with me. Um, this isn't an exact quote, but what is it that collages can achieve that words and conventional architectural drawings, like plan sections and elevations, cannot? Can placing buildings and compositions on paper, like sentences on top of sentences, have material consequences, like stacking bricks on top of bricks? Um, so the, the relationship between how words and images can have a, a real and material consequences, that's something that I've always thought about. I'm gonna talk about what all this means. Um, I've just given some kind of theoretical background to what paper architecture and narrative architecture is. And now I'm gonna talk about the very real ways that um, ideology and narrative manifest itself in the built world. Um, so last year in July, 2021, Vladimir Putin wrote a manifesto called on the historical unity of Ukraine and Russia. In the 5,000 word manifesto, Putin made his case for the Russian Federation's stake over Ukraine, claiming that Vladimir Lenin was the architect of the modern day country, writing, therefore modern Ukraine is entirely the product of the Soviet era. He also wrote that Russia was robbed indeed by the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party when Ukraine was dubbed its own separate state. So this is a very long essay that I just tried to summarize for you, uh, but the overall narrative that Putin has created to justify his invasion is that Ukraine and Russia are, are one people and always have been. Large parts of this narrative were crafted by Putin's longtime associate Vladimir Solovayev, a journalist in Moscow who many have described as Russia's Steve Bannon. 
Central to Putin and Solovayev's rhetoric has been the narrative that Ukraine is under occupation by a neo-fascist regime, regime and that it's become a Nazi state whose peoples need liberation. Um, so external observers like Anders Asplund from um, Stockholm described Putin's manifesto as a declaration of war on Ukraine. Um, and And Asplund specifically said that his manifesto was a masterclass in disinformation. Um, and if you read it, it's it's filled with uh, really dense history and it's amazing how history can be warped. It's just another example of the things I'm talking about. But so a year later, Putin delivered a speech in Moscow as echoing the manifesto's main sentiments as a foreshadow for what was to come. On February 21st, 2022, Russia officially recognized Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. The following day, Putin stated that the Minsk agreements no longer existed and that the liberation operation of Ukraine was inevitable, phrase from his manifesto. And the next photos show how Putin's narrative um, manifest. So this is Kharkiv, Ukraine today, the uh, country's second largest city. Um, this building stands above Freedom Square. It's one of the most important cultural parts of the city. Um, and this is the this is what Putin's manifesto in action looks like. It's very real. Words matter a lot. Um, so I just gave a quick example of narrative architecture as an instrument for oppression. Um, now I'd like to give an example of narrative architecture as a tool of liberation. Over 100 years ago, Ukrainian revolutionaries overthrew the Tsarist regime that exploited them. This took place after a long history of revolt, culminating in the regime's successful overthrow in 1917. Afterward, culture flourished. Architects and artists formed new schools of thought to imagine what a truly class classless society would look like. Um, one of the most interesting narrative architects from that time in Ukraine's history was a Yiddish playwright named Kalman Zingman. That's him on the right here. Um, and Kalman wrote a incredible piece of science fiction literature in Yiddish called Inadenia, City of the Future. And what Adenia was, was essentially a projection into the future from the year 1918 to the year 1940. And the story was about uh, the future city of Kharkiv, but what he calls a dini. Um, so I'm gonna read some words from him. Zygmunt's utopia was a vision for a new world of tolerance and culture in Eastern Ukraine, described in a translation by Jordan Finken. The novella is a projection forwards from the 1910s to the 1940s. In Zygmunt's utopia, money is no longer needed. Every citizen has their material needs provided for. National communities, including Jews, Ukrainians, Poles, Russians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Greeks, Moldovans, Romani, and Turks all live in complete harmony. Anti-Semitism, nationalism, and racism are punishable offenses. Yeah. In Adenia even foretold of flying arrow trains, an artificially regulated climate, and an abundance of gardens with children celebrating Jewish holidays by their parents. Zingman even sets aside spaces in his card of Utopia for memorials dedicated to Bolshevik artists and writers, including Elizitsky, who is my personal hero. Um, so prior to the uprising in 1917, the socialist movement in Kharkiv faced violent suppression by ultra-nationalist groups, firmly backed by the local police and funded by the Tsar. In opposition, the Kharkiv locomotive factory was described as a citadel of revolutionary movement against the Tsar, employing over 6,000 militant workers. After the successful 1917 uprising, Bolsheviks transferred Ukraine's capital from Kiev to Kharkiv, around the same time Russia's capital was transferred from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Shortly after the transfer, an outburst of utopian, egalitarian, futurist visions 
for Kharkiv ensued, imagining the city as a haven for all peoples fleeing persecution from European bourgeois society and the impending rise of fascism. So in the post-revolutionary period, the Kharkiv would become the site of radical new forms of architecture and art, as well as novel government services for the working class. Kharkiv, there weren't just things happening in literature, but there were physical things happening. The architecture and the literature fed into one another. So the, the photo we're looking at here is the Palace of Culture for, for Railway Workers by Alexander Dmitriev. Um, it was built from 1927 to 1932 to honor the railway workers that were the staples of the, of the uprising. Um, this is a photo of the Palace of Industry, which y'all might have seen in the news, also known as uh, Ukrainian Stershprom. Um, overlooking Freedom Square as this first Soviet skyscraper. Other aerial photos. Uh, between 1930 and 1934, uh, another Ukrainian architect, Pablo Alyosha, designed what was called New Kharkiv, which was basically a, a model for worker housing and the Soviet Union's first five year plan. And um, I want to read some quotes of his that I find to be particularly beautiful. So foundational to the architect's mission was the belief in creating a new world, building a just society for all, and infusing the district with intellectual and artistic wealth. What do you think? Uh, this is just a kind of plan showing the ancient city of Kharkiv in relation to the new city built around the grid. Um, this is another kind of art wrenchingly beautiful project um, that I'd like to talk about, which is at risk today of being bombed, destroyed. The Kiev Crematorium um, is basically a place for um, funeral processions, mostly for Jews that uh, had lost loved ones in Babin Yar, where tens of thousands of Jews were figured in the Holocaust. Um, so uh, things can be a bit hard to talk about. This is a quote from the architectural record that I find interesting. So the incineration of bodies was a controversial topic in Ukraine in the 1960s, after the horrors of the Holocaust during World War II, and particularly the Nazi massacre at Babi Yar. The topic had just started to be discussed publicly when this odd-shaped neo-modernist concrete crematorium was built in Kiev. Taking into account the sensitivity of the subject, architects designed the new structure to avoid any association with the process of cremation. Sculpted from white concrete with curving lines, meant to be calming and therapeutic to any funeral attendees and mourners that gathered, gathered at the site. So um, this is a very hard project to talk about, but it's also one that, um, I think is an incredible example of narrative architecture. Um, and to wrap up the part of the lecture that discusses Ukraine, uh, this is a quote from a friend, Jenny Bukina. Ukraine's architectural history has always been told through the lens of empire, through the lens of Russia. So as I was talking earlier, well, earlier, history is not neutral, neither is literature. We just saw how books and literature can be vehicles for colonization and war. The usage of narrative architecture for tell other worlds happens throughout the world. The spiritual foundations of occupied Palestine today can be found in a book called Old New Land by Theodore Herzl, who many describe as the ideologue of political Zionism. This is him. Herzl published a pamphlet in Poland called Alt New Land, or An Old New World, describing a new Jewish state in Palestine with the city of Tel Aviv as its haven for Jews fleeing Europe, much like Commons. Herzl's story follows two European colonizers that leave aristocratic Prussia to found a new settlement in, quote, the sparsely populated, destitute, and backwards country of Palestine. Today, as Herzl is recognized as, as the spiritual father of the Jewish state, it was among the earliest proponents for the state of Israel and Palestinian land. So this is another example of a creationist myth that eventually became a country. So 16 years before Kalman Zingman's story was published, the founder of political Zionism imagined a very different future 
for European Jews fleeing persecution from the Pale of Settlement, where my family comes from. By contrast, Singman's novella imagines a very different future for European Jews by creating a multicultural pluralist state for all ethnic groups fleeing persecution in Eastern Ukraine. In relative proximity to the Pale of Settlement, where a majority of European Jews are cited for centuries in derelict poverty. And this is a quote that Herzl writes in his book, um, if you will it, this shall not be a legend. So it's a real example of the power of words. Now they become, can become buildings and cities. Um, and so um, I had mentioned earlier the architect Sharon Rothbard that writes a lot about occupied Palestine and the history of Tel Aviv, where he lives. Um, this is a quote from his book. Tel Aviv was at first a book and only later a city. Um, and the reason that Rothbard felt compelled to write his book was in 2004, UNESCO recognized Tel Aviv uh, as a World Heritage Site. And in reality, the city of Tel Aviv isn't that old. It's really just from the early 1900s, while the city of Yaffa is ancient. Um, but so the narrative that had been cultivated around Tel Aviv as the white city basically comes from uh, this idea that the city itself cultivated was that it was created by um, white European Jews that had studied at the Bauhaus, fled persecution, and they moved to Tel Aviv to build a city on basically tabula rasa, where what they, how history has told us, nobody was there. At least that's what they would have you believe. Um, and so Rothbard felt very compelled to uh, write a counter narrative to the white city narrative about um, the yeah. And this is just kind of an example. This is a photo of um, the office water from uh, no, enabled these beautiful international style buildings to be built. And were built on Burroughs. Um, and just like I was talking about violence in Ukraine, there's violence in Palestine as we speak um, as a result largely of the world that Theodore Herzl created in his book. The photos of Al-Maqsa Mosque, uh, which is under, no, sorry, the one on the left is in front of me. Um, this is just a photo of Sharon's book, which I've always found to be really inspiring. So on the left is the book that uh, he's kind of counteracting against, uh, White City by Michael Levin, which kind of became the uh, main story that was told uh, about Tel Aviv as a city of, of, uh, that grew out of the Bauhaus. And then Sharon's book, White City, Black City. White City refers to Tel Aviv. Black City refers to Yaffa. Um, and it's just a story about uh, uh, counteracting the European colonial history that's been told. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what this, how this plays out in the US. So. Um, so on the left is a, is a photo of Yaffa's waterfront that had been destroyed in the 30s, right? So you can see there were buildings there. Now, um, the sketch that you see on the left was by a, a really well-known um, Israeli artist that was kind of the visionary for the, the redevelopment of Yaffa's waterfront. And the sketch kind of became a quintessential napkin sketch for it. Um, the, a kind of utopian, lovely part of the city that could be built on the water. But the interesting thing about drawing is what this drawing is what you don't see. So the part of the water that's just kind of empty, that's where thousands of people had lived. And it's an example of how drawings can be a sign of, an, of erasure. And um, so we also see examples of that in uh, places that are closer to home in the Hudson River School, and how they made paintings. Um, so the you see on the right is a painting from the 1800s of New York's Hudson Valley. And coming back to uh, the folks at Why Think Tank, they have some really beautiful criticism of this painting about basically art produced on behalf of colonization in general. It's, it's not about what you see, it's about what you don't see. You don't see the indigenous people that populated this land before European colonizers. It's, 
Um, it's an idyllic scene, but it's a very bloody scene at the same time. Um, you don't see in the Hudson River School examples of the Pequot being massacred. Um, and just like um, we were looking at Putin's manifesto, just we were looking at other manifestos. All manifestos have authors, very specific authors. And manifest destiny is a phrase that was coined in 1845, and it has a very specific source too. There's a journalist named John Sullivan. Um, the phrase was coined in 1845 and was a widely held cultural belief in the 19th century US that American settlers were destined to expand across North America. Um, and there were three basic themes to manifest us. The special virtues of the American people and their institutions, the mission of the United States to redeem and remake the West in the image of the agrarian East. Um, so these are beliefs and values that eventually became material. Uh, this is a great essay by Chris Cornelius that talks about uh, just critiquing Thanksgiving Day paintings that express the themes. This is a great theme. Um, talking about so the, the classic painting of Manifest Destiny on the left. Um, just kind of how this story resulted in a toxic uh, hellscape. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how this can be applied in an actual design project and all of this stuff. So now I'm just going to give some examples of uh, my own work. So this was a project that I started in uh, 2018 as a grad student in Moscow. As you can see, Russia, Eastern Europe are very um, part of my thinking because I studied there. My family is from there. So it's a place I'm particularly interested in. And so uh, this project is called the Mendelstam House Museum. It is an unbuilt museum proposal uh, for a site in Moscow. Um, the concept is a house museum for two writers in a building where they never lived or even visited. So this is who it was for. Uh, to the left is a poet named Moshe Mandelstam, uh, who was born in Warsaw and um, died in 1930. And on the right was his partner and poet Nadezhda Mandelstam and somebody who doesn't really get um, credited as being the co-author Mandelstam's of Osip's poetry, but she was. And um, I'll explain how a little bit later. So, Bushup Mendelstam has been described as Russia's greatest poet of the 20th century. Joseph Brodsky said that. Um, another critic said that yeah. Mendelstam is the greatest Russian poet after Pushkin. But if you have ever been to Moscow, you'll see that today there's only one memorial to him, and um, it's not very prominent. And that's due to some pretty serious political reasons. Um, Mendelstam is a bit of a national trauma, honestly. It's um, he's somebody who a lot of people really love and whose poetry beloved. Um, but it's somebody that is very politicized because um, he was killed by the state, and so he's kind of become a symbol of resistance in the country. Um, and because he did, he died in such obscurity, um, there's no museum for him. There's just a monument. And so this is a quote of the Dejdas from about 1960. She said, I know that there isn't a space where a Mandelstam museum can be created. The apartment is no longer there. The houses where I used to live are either forgotten or demolished. His grave is lost without a name. And I doubt that any street on this earth will be named after him. Um, and so, starting around 2018 uh, with some activists uh, and political scientists in Moscow, we became really interested in kind of revisiting what a Mandelstam museum would look like. Um, and this, so the question that we were faced with is, how do you design a museum for somebody where you don't know they were buried? Um, you don't know where they lived. There are no artifacts or objects remaining from their life. So that was the challenge. Um, 
And it was a challenge, but I think it produced something really interesting that I'm really proud of. So uh, this you've been to Russia or Eastern Europe. So the House Museum is a really common place um, in cities where if a writer had lived there, they'll preserve the house and make them open to the public. Um, and so obviously this wasn't an option for the Mendelstams. Um, so basically we created this matrix where house museums can be understood as kind of having three components. Um, there's the physical house itself. There's the objects in the house, like the bed where they slept or the kitchen table where they ate. And then the stories that tour guides use to um, animate the house, bring the objects to life. Um, and so we created those three discernible parts. And at the end of it, we realized that you know, the only thing that we have about Mandelstam is the stories, and we don't even have all of his work. Um, so basically, uh, that be, so stories, immaterial stories became the, the content. Uh, so this is just a line drawing of the building that we chose. It's, it was uh, only about half occupied, so it was pretty much abandoned. Um, this just kind of shows all of the different materials and styles. Really beautiful building. Um, it was just kind of empty. Color palettes. Yeah. So, um, in line with the kind of iconoclasm of the project, uh, the ultimate design delivery that we proposed was just a list of list of words that were basically kind of memes and tropes from Mendelstam's writings. Uh, so there was no physical design; it was just a list of words. And the idea was um, that with the list of words, we could invite other artists to create work specifically about particular themes. So um, for instance, one artist would respond to uh, Mendelstam's poems about stone. And basically the idea was that because we don't have any existing artifacts from his life, what if um, the artwork that gets produced by the artists in the present, that becomes the content uh, that we put on display in the museum. So basically how we think about Mendel, the Mendelstams today in the present and the material artifacts that we create for them in the present, that becomes what we have on display. Um, and this was just, this is the only object that is remaining it's where Mendelstam's uh, poems had been hidden in a drawer for 40 years in a secret compartment. Um, and the only reason that we have any of OSIP's, most of OSIP's um, work today is because the Dejta had single-handedly written almost every single poem with him. So she memorized them verbatim. And so um, when, after he had died, um, she had retained this information in her mind, her po uh, his poetry for 30 years. And um, until Khrushchev came to power, that's when she actually and wrote out every almost every single one of his poems. So that's what we have. So um, yeah, it was just the question of how we uh, depict Adejda's kind of role in the artistic process was, was critical. Um, and this is just a drawing of uh, how we could curate the table to create a kind of profound experience to show how um, significant of an object it is. Um, so now I'm going to go through the next few projects pretty quickly so we can have some uh, space for time. But um, this is the project I've been working on the last four years that I've lived in New York since I finished school. Um, it's called the Bigger Apple Plan. Uh, it's for an office called Rethink NYC uh, with my friend Jim and Tori. And it's an example of regional planning in New York. And earlier I was kind of talking about the importance of narrative architecture and projects like the Green New Deal. So uh, the Bigger Apple Plan is basically a wide, wide, wide um, uh, plan for better rail transit and regional governments throughout New York. And so my job as the kind of book editor was taking this highly complex um, infrastructure plan with a lot of moving parts and writing very clearly about it so that it could be understood. Um, and I was also responsible for doing the drawings. So um, this shows basically 
the foundation of the plan, which is called the Regional Unified Network. And the Regional Unified Network is the unification of Greater New York's three commuter rail systems into a new subway system. Um, so the bigger Apple plan was and still is a, a challenge in narrative architecture and how you consolidate a lot of moving parts into one clear um, argument. Um, so this is an example of a museum curation. Uh, it's an art installation that's still up in Seattle with, uh, I did it with my friend Andrew Santa Lucia and Brian Levitt. Um, Eleanor is an altar to anti-fascist architecture. Um, and as you can see, uh, so this icon weighs about a thousand pounds. It was designed by Andrew and built by Andrew in his backyard in his garage. Um, and then he drove it himself to Seattle. But so, um, then so the, it's, the installation was twofold. It was the icon and then as you can see these prayer candles. And so the idea for the project was to um, react against the fetishism of fascist architecture in um, the US, which uh, for anybody that's taken a history and theory course, um, names like Giuseppe Tarani, um, another Italian and German fascist, these are, we, we felt that uh, there was a story that wasn't being told in the US. So we basically wanted to create an icon that brought to light examples of anti-fascist work. This is that project. Um, so the icon just came out absolutely beautiful. And then so my role in the project was curating the prayer candles. So there are 40 candles and each candle is dedicated to an anti-fascist building. Um, and the buildings range from the Democratic Republic of the Congo to Warsaw, to former Yugoslavia, to Algeria. Um, so we basically were interested in appropriating kind of religious architectural language and putting it towards something agnostic, um, making an altar to something that we find to be very important. Um, just on Monday, I, I gave a lecture for Andrew's class about uh, anti-fascist architecture and it's a project that we're turning into a book several years. Um, and so a lot of our, so language is so important, right? So a lot of the work that we were doing is kind of reclaiming words that have been misappropriated in the last 20 years, like the social condenser. So um, I hear this word getting used a lot to describe places like the High Line in New York or the Seattle Public Library. And so for me as a historian that's interested in socialist art and architecture, um, that's just not what, it, those examples just aren't what social condensers are. Um, and so I'm really interested in kind of averting and returning this language to the collectivist origins that where they come from. These are just some of the points. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is uh, the last thing that I'll talk about tonight. Um, the Slona City um, General Motors and the Management of the Future is a book project that I was just awarded a contract for by Dome Publishers in Berlin. And um, I'll just read a quick uh, snippet from the back. So this is what the book is about. What followed the Fortis city has been popularly described as the post Fortis city, the post industrial city, the innovative city, the creative city, and even the post capitalist city, among many other terms with the preface, prefix post attached to them. The language that's been used to describe the post Fortis built world suggests that our present epoch spontaneously designed without a mastermind or creator as an anonymously produced byproduct of the new economy no clearly attributable, ar attributable architect to associate it with. Post-Fordist, post-industrial, post-capitalist, for instance, all suggest this. In the tradition of Valder economics, this book makes the case that Alfred Sloan, president, CEO, and chairman of General Motors from 1923 to 1966, was the architect of post-Fordism. Sloan City tells a complex story about the founder of the modern corporation, now a system of corporate governance at General Motors, impacted the built environment across the globe throughout the 20th century into the present. 
Um, so again, as you can see, uh, earlier in the lecture, I was talking about the creation of Smiths and their authors. Alfred Sloan, uh, when he was president of GM, is somebody that's done more to impact all of our lives in this room than a lot of people, but uh, he's somebody that has gone under the radar. So I'm very interested in exploring, um, bringing to light just like how exactly the US auto industry worked with the federal government to shape the country's infrastructure in the 20th century. Um, so that's all I have prepared today. How much lecture? Um, how do I unmute? Uh, yes, I think he is muted. David, did you have? Yeah, Daniel. Daniel, that was uh, just a, a complete tour de force of a lecture. Uh, you covered an enormous amount of ground, and you you planted uh, a, a lot of seeds for for serious questions. And we can only scratch the surface of that. But that that's okay. I mean, I, this is a garden to be cultivated. So, congratulations to you for for that. Um, I want to start just just with the, the premise about the idea of narrative architecture, um, because I, I think you you absolutely are are onto something. And, and I want to ask you though about the importance of that, especially in a digital age where the narrative idea seems to be subsumed into something else, and it is that what I would call a kind of sampling mentality that isn't so much about any kind of narrative as I understand it, but a, a, a series of, of kind of fragments really that that are, are one, one um, wishes could tell a story, but I'm not sure always do. How, how do you see this digital world fitting into your, your argument? That's a great question. And it reminds me of uh, some teachers I had when I was in Moscow, um, uh, a design, a graphic design office called Meta Haven. And um, Meta Haven, uh, they also do film. And they, they're kind of experimental filmmakers that do some pretty interesting stuff. And one of the projects they did was um, they created a film in 10 different parts. But then they released the film uh, on different parts of the internet on different platforms. So some of the snippets were on YouTube, others were on some less known websites, I kind of forget where. But so MetaHaven was yeah, really interested in exactly that, like the decentralization of a central narrative. And I think kind of how eventually the pieces come back together in the viewer. But um, yeah, to, to, to more accurately answer your question, um, actually one of, one of the other ways I thought about opening this lecture tonight was, um, a concept I call being uh, image drunk. And uh, what that means is basically being so inundated with imagery from screens um, that it almost feels impossible to make any sense of anything that you're being told or communicated. And so, um, yeah, I, if anything, I think that, uh, I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but things like architecture criticism and journalism and writing and slow writing where we really slow down to make sense of it all um, is just so important because so much of the media that is fed to us today uh, is what McLuhan would call a hot medium where we're being told something, not really participating and digesting it. And so uh, we're just getting more and more of that. So um, I'm kind of interested in how we can step away from the digital back to our core normal. There's a lot to talk about and I, I, I don't wanna, uh, monopolize this, but but um, let's let's find some time to have to continue this discussion. Thank you so much for for a really provocative talk. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Let the chat and see if there's any other any other questions from our largest audience yet for these lectures. Let us stay to the end. Thank you, Julian. What's your question? Um, um, uh, stand up and talk loudly. <laughs> Hi, that's my question. Hi, Julian. Hello. <laughs> Interesting question, Julian. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, any any thoughts? I, I have a quick question. It's not so much up, about stand up so we can hear it. Not so much about your lecture, but what class do you teach? I teach um, fourth year studio. Uh, yeah. So I, I just started at Kane last September. Would you like to do a seminar with Professor Roche? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. That would be great. Well, after after Dr. Wilkins' lecture last week, we talked a little bit about um, yeah, a seminar dedicated to architecture criticism and writing uh, and journalism. So, what's your name? Oh, my name is Heldren. Okay, so uh, you you just signed up for the class. Got three more years, so she's so okay. Yeah, first year. Uh. Anyone else questions? Um, I was wondering, you were saying that your family is from Eastern. How far back then? Now, my, my father's side came from the Ukraine, so okay. I'm Ukrainian, but I was wondering for your, your side, what's the story in terms of coming to America when and yeah. who are they? Yeah. My great grandfather immigrated from Belarus from a shtetl to the Bronx. Um, and there was actually uh, something really interesting that just happened. Uh, so my great grandfather was the only one to, to leave Belarus and the rest of his siblings stayed. Um, but I was just reconnected with my family that stayed and they, instead of going to New York, they went to Leningrad. Well, I and uh, I was just, re we were reconnected after like 80 years. Wow. They live in Brooklyn. We had, we had no idea what happened though. Oh, really? But yeah, they live in Brighton Beach. So we, we just got dinner like a few nights, a few weeks That's ago. Nice. But uh, yeah, so fourth generation, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, as you can see in the lecture, I, I, um, and I'm so interested in your project with uh, Open, for, uh, Open, Open Gaza. Gaza. Um, yeah, I mean, questions of Jewish identity. So Mendelstam in the Dejda, Osa Mendelstam, they, they were both Jewish. And yeah. um, so these questions of Jewish identity are, really important to me and questions of identity in general. Um, so, yeah. That's interesting when the, is, uh, someone in Israel is criticizing you know, the policies. Yeah. Like not being anti-Semitic, but criticizing the kind of political policy of the power. Rothbard is Jewish. Yeah. 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 So they're, they're probably the strongest critics. But uh, Yeah. He's, he's a tour de force. He's white city, black city wasn't only just a stellar criticism of what was happening, but also just, I mean, as we can see, that can be applied to so many other examples. Yeah. Some sort of universal. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. because every time there's uh, police activity on Temple Mount, there will almost be, that's when the intifada starts. So unfortunately, it sounds like we're in another cycle, which is just terrible. But yeah. it's always the, the ordinary people who suffer. Yeah. Oh yeah, lots. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask if it's kind of like a personal opinion type of thing. If you think that the architecture that could be done, let's say like 50 or 100 years into the future, would be inspiring um, the new created texts or writing uh, that people do, or if, for example, um, the architecture that we kind of visualize for the future could be inspired by the things that have been written today or like in several years in the past. Um, not sure I totally. It's, it sounds like a really, I'm not sure I totally follow. Oh, well, formulate it better. If you think that stuff that happens in the future um, would set up like new ways of writing for architecture like a new set of rules ah. or if you think that the architecture of the future is going to be shaped by how people from the past visualize how the future looks like oh uh the latter it's the second one i think yeah so i mentioned uh an architect that i greatly admire um elizitsky uh he wrote a book called the architecture of world revolution and one of the best quotes from it is that social revolution precedes technological revolution and so for me, what that means is um, somebody, somebody that I, whose work I don't like, uh, that I critique a lot is Patrick Schumacher. And, um, you know, he, 
he's kind of known for making all of these crazy looking futuristic buildings, but his politic his politics are awful. Uh, and he's a horrible human being. Uh, <laughs> he's not listening, I don't think. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But uh, anyways, so 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 Schumacher, right? Like he's making he thinks that he's created an architecture of the future, but uh, do we want to adopt his politics? Hell no. So okay. I think that the politics that we discuss and we cultivate now, um, it's impossible to know what form they could take in the in the built world. But yeah, it's, a, it's the second part of that. I think it's, it's yeah. you know Patrick Schumacher is he is the right hand person for Zaha Hadid, and when she passed away, he's kind of now in charge of Zaha Hadid Architects. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> he just wants to privatize everything, basically. Yeah, I, I've heard about him, but I didn't know that he was the one. Um, like the he's not the only one. They're out of market. So that's the so coming back to narrative architecture, right? Narrative architecture versus formalism. One of my projects was just a list of words, not a single drawing of a building. Um, so I think we're kind of and we're exiting a time where I think in general, like I, I talk a lot about why think tank. They're interested in a lot of the same things. Um, Storytelling and formalism are kind of at odds. So I think today we're very interested in the, the storytelling part. I want to just say that I think Dan bears an uncanny resemblance to Bark Ingalls, but he's the nice version, <laughs> <laughs> the ethical version of Bark Ingalls. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to thank, thank Dan very much for ending our terrific uh, series where we got to see what. Your teachers are thinking, and thank you all for participating. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Good jacket. Good jacket? That's the third compliment I've gotten on this jacket. Yeah, that's Dan. Like, thank you. The guy on the train gave me one, too. It's like the best way to start your day. I love it. I just don't come by. I got, yeah, we all got to start wearing jackets. Things went with you. My spring. Okay. And it's like, oh, I think we should. Why are we doing what? Why are we doing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.